today I chose to talk about arithmetic statistics in number theory, which is a pretty much trendy um, approach now in number theory. Uh, but before saying anything, I have to spend a few words uh, telling you what arithmetic statistics um, really is. So um, when a number theorist says arithmetic statistics, um, what he usually or she usually means is I have a set of number theoretic objects with certain properties, and we want to count these objects. We want to describe the frequency of occurrence of these objects. And although it's trendy um, nowadays to use arithmetic statistics, uh, but the approach itself is very classical. It goes back to more than 200 years ago. So um, let me start with a very classical example, um, the example of primes how to count primes, how to see the occurrence of primes among other integers. So um, people changed their perspective about primes. They started with uh, questioning themselves, if I have a prime, what would be the next prime? And we didn't have much answers um, till the era of Gauss. So what Gauss did was the following. Gauss thought about the whole set of primes instead of thinking about one prime. Um, so um, Gauss counted all prime numbers up to a certain bound X. And then what he did, he started computing this counting function up to the millions using his hands. And I'm talking about this approach more than 200 years ago. So Gauss spent his time counting all the prime numbers up to a certain bound up to six millions. And then by looking at all these data, he claimed that when you count all the primes and then you average them by the bound that you chose, then this acts asymptotically to one over log X, which was a big claim back then. And it took us more than 100 years to prove this claim. So Hadamard together with De La Vallée Poussin proved that this claim is indeed correct. In fact, they proved that when you take the quotient of these two functions here, then the limit when x goes to infinity is one. Um, the reason I like this example is it tells you how number theory compared to other branches of mathematics rely heavily on collective data. So we were able to come up with this big theorem because Gauss took the time to collect data up to the millions using his hands. And if you think that Gauss was the only one doing that, well, nowadays, that's basically what we are doing in number theory. We are collecting data, and then based on the data, we're coming up with conjectures. And then we spend months trying to prove these conjectures. Right. Another thing is um, this example shows you that number theory is, on about, not, is not about single instances. It's more about aggregates. It's more about data, collective data. So instead of thinking about one prime, think about the whole set of primes. <clears throat> so Barry Mazur is claiming the following. Um, aggregates, they appear to us even if we're not looking for them. Even, we are look, even if we are looking for single instances, aggregates appear to us, collective data appear to us. And he's supporting this claim with a question. And actually, he offered the prize for whoever can answer this question. And the prize is a $5 prize. That was in one of the Erdush Memorial um, talks. So the question is the following. You choose A and B relatively prime, and then you think about a linear map, AX plus B. And the question is, can you prove that this linear map represents infinitely many primes? In fact, at least one prime. But that's not the whole question. The rest of the question is the following. Don't prove it for infinitely many primes. Prove it for only finitely many primes. So we all know how to answer this question. In fact, this is some of the things that we prove for our analytic number, th number theory students in a first undergraduate course. Um, but the extra part of the question, the extra bit is don't prove it for infinitely many, just to prove it for finitely many. And then Barry Mazur claimed that his $5 is safe and there is no single proof in literature that proves this fact, the first line, without proving it for infinitely many primes. No matter how hard you are trying, you will prove it only for infinitely many primes. You cannot prove it for finite, just finitely many primes. Um, so let me dig deep um, in this question here. 
Um, these are the set of our primes. These are the first few primes. Uh, the red ones are the ones that are congruent to one module four. So four times one plus one, that's four times two, three plus one, four times four plus one, and so on. The black ones are the ones congruent to three module four. So if you stack all primes, they are either congruent to one module four or they're congruent to three module four. And again, in a first elementary number theory course, as an application of quadratic uh, reciprocity, we teach our student that we can indeed prove that there are infinitely many primes that are red, so they are congruent to one module four, and there are infinitely many that are black, so they are congruent to three module four. But infinity for number theorists is not enough. The question really is, what's the proportion of primes that look like four n plus one, so the red ones, among all primes? Is there a way we can find the proportion of them among all primes or not? And here comes arithmetic statistics because we are trying to count now. We are trying to describe the frequency of occurrence. So the approach is the following. The approach was um, suggested by Dirichlet in his famous um, Dirichlet theorem in arithmetic progression. All you need to do is count all the primes that looks like four n plus one, four and one are not special, just choose a and b or a and b relatively prime up to a certain bound x. And then you quotient by the total number of primes up to this bound x. Then you take the limit when x goes to infinity and then you pray that this limit exists. And in fact, Dirichlet managed to prove that this limit exists, not only this, he computed it explicitly. He managed to show that it's equal to one over phi a where phi is the Euler torsion function. So the Euler torsion function is the function that counts all the integers up to a relatively prime to a. So there are no common divisors between these integers and a. So back to our question here, if I want to count all primes that look like one modulo four, then according to Dirichlet, this is one over five, four, which is half. So half of the primes will look like one modulo four, half of the primes will look like three modulo four. So half of the primes are red, half of the primes are black. <clears throat> right, today I'm not going to talk about integers or primes. I'm going to talk about another um, number theoretic objects, polynomial equation. So I'm going to start with a polynomial equation in n variables. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume that my polynomial is homogeneous. So every term in the polynomial, every monomial is of the same degree. And I'm going to assume again for simplicity that all the coefficients are integers. So for example, think about x cubed plus y cubed or x to the power four plus x y cubed. So these are polynomials of um, in two variables and they are homogeneous. Right, and then the basic questions to ask, the basic question that any number theory, theorist would ask are following. Sorry? Right, so the first question is, thinking about this polynomial equations, can I find non-trivial solutions to this polynomial equations with integer coordinates? So not only solutions, I'm interested only in solutions with integer coordinates. So that's an existence question. And if I have a yes answer to this question, then I have two other questions. They are more of quantitative questions. Um, can I find these solutions explicitly? Can I describe them all? Is there a way I can describe all these solutions? Another question, in fact, question number three is what computational number theorists do. I'd be looking for an algorithm, a set of instructions that give me either negative or positive answers to question one and question two. So I'm looking for a machine, I'm looking for an algorithm. I'm going to feed my polynomial equations to this algorithm, and I'm expecting the output to be either, I have no solutions or not, and if yes, please, this algorithm will give me the solution, and maybe it will describe all these uh, solutions explicitly. Right, so here's a glimpse of hope. If the degree of f is one or two, then we can answer question one. In fact, question number two and the question number three, they have affirmative answers. So I can find all solutions, if any. I can describe them all explicitly. And there is an algorithm that tells me exactly what to do. Um, now, what if degree f is larger than or equal to three? So let me give you a heads up. If the degree is at least three, then the answers to question number one, question number two, question number three is we really don't know. So we didn't know explicitly whether we can find a solution or not. Um, if such solution exists, we didn't know how to find this solution. 
and we don't know how to describe it explicitly in general, let alone finding an algorithm. Um, so we are stuck. And I'm talking about degree F larger than or equal to three. So let alone if the degree is uh, relatively large. So here comes arithmetic statistics. So arithmetic statistics is providing us with a different approach. So instead of thinking about a single polynomial equation, a single instance, here comes aggregates. Think about the whole set of polynomial equations. So if I'm fixing the degree, if I'm fixing the number of variables, the question is, again, what's the proportion of homogeneous polynomials of that degree in that number of variables that have non-trivial integer zeros, right? So again, these are the classical questions, one, two, and three. The red question is the red question offered by um, arithmetic statistics. So I'm going to start, I'm not going to be greedy. I'm going to start with the degree being exactly three. So my polynomial equation is of degree three, homogeneous and three variables. Um, so again, homogeneous, this means that every single term has degree three. Think about x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed. Um, and then I'm going to assume two more mild conditions. The first condition is look, about, look at the geometric uh, picture. If this homogeneous polynomial equation describes a smooth curve, and again, this is a very simple thing to check, all you need to do is find all the partial derivatives with respect to the first, second, and third variable, and make sure that these partial derivatives, they don't vanish simultaneously. So it's not hard to check. And the second condition is, at least there is one trivial solution with integer coordinates that I can start with. So these are the two conditions that I'm going to start with um, on these polynomials of degree three. In fact, if these two conditions are satisfied, then geometrically, that's what we call an elliptic curve. So in the rest of this talk, I'll be talking about these elliptic curves. So polynomial equations and three variables of degree three with these two very mild conditions. So we like elliptic curves. Probably you have heard about elliptic curves. Um, if you are a number theorist, you will hear about elliptic curves. If you are a physicist, you will hear about elliptic curves. Even if you are interested in technology, you will be hearing about elliptic curves, elliptic curves, uh, cryptography. These are the things that are used to secure exchange of information nowadays. Uh, so elliptic curves, they appear everywhere now. Even calculus students might have seen them if you are dealing with elliptic integrals. Um, the good thing about elliptic curves, let's talk about the algebra now, starting with a polynomial of degree three and three variables homogeneous, after a certain change of variables, I can always reach this, reach this uh, equation. Y squared on one side, X cubed plus AX plus B on the other side. So no matter which polynomial of degree three and three variables you are going to start with, I can transform it into this format. And if you remember the smoothness condition, the smoothness condition can be translated in terms of the coefficients a and b as follows. This expression must be different from zero. And not only this, we have a group structure. So let me sketch one of these elliptic curves. So this is typically how we sketch such a cubic curve described by such equation, as long as it has uh, this polynomial here has one real root. So that's the intersection point with the x-axis. The group flow is described as follows. Take two points on the elliptic curve. I want to find p plus q. So you join these two points using a line. This line will intersect the curve in the third point. All you need to do is reflect it about the x-axis. That point here is the sum of p and q. You can check all the axioms of a group. So that's a group operation. And if you want to add a point to itself, instead of thinking about this secant line, think about the tangent. So think about the tangent to P. This tangent, again, will intersect the curve in a third point. And again, you reflect it about the x-axis. And this process is what we call the coordinate tangent process. So it has a group structure, and this group structure can be visualized very simply the way I did. Right. So I have a group structure. And now I'm going to... Um, emphasize on this specific set. So I'm not only interested in the elliptic curve, I'm interested in points X and Y, satisfying this equation still, but as a number theorist, I'm going to assume moreover that X and Y must be rational numbers. So I'm interested in a subset of the elliptic curve, not every pair X and Y on the elliptic curve, but the pairs for which X and Y are both rational numbers. 
And this can be checked to be a subgroup. So it's a nice set. It turns out to be a subgroup. So I'm keeping the group structure. And this is what elliptic curves and diophantine geometry is about. Um, this subgroup here is the set that has been motivating us for over 150 years. We are still investigating this subgroup right here. Many open questions are still open, um, challenging us with no hope of a near answer. And again, because we are looking for a very specific question, arithmetic statistics at least will provide us with asymptotic um, answers to these questions. Right, so let me start with um, one celebrated theorem about this subgroup that I mentioned. Um, it turns out it's not only an abelian group, it is a finitely generated abelian group. And in a graduate algebra course, we teach our student that as long as you have a finitely generated abelian group, then the fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian group will tell us that this subgroup right here, it has a finite part called the torsion part, and it has an infinite part. And the infinite part is very nice. It's nothing but our copies of Z. So it turns out that this amazing subgroup EQ has a finite part, has an infinite part. And if you want to study some elliptic curves, you only need to study either the torsion part or the infinite part, which is our copies of Z. Right. Um, so again, this is the main picture for the rest of um, the seminar. I have an infinite part. I have a finite part. R is called the rank of E. And R basically describes how big the infinite part is. And T is the torsion part. Uh, in 1978, Mazur managed to classify the torsion part of an elliptic curve over the rational field. It's one of these 15 groups. So it's either a cyclic group, where the order of the cyclic group is between 1 and 12, different from 11, or it is a product of two cyclic groups of this format. And he proved that this list is complete. So give me any subgroup out of these 15, I can find you an elliptic curve whose torsion is this. So obviously, we know everything about the torsion part of the elliptic curve. But still, I have 15 subgroups. So a legitimate question to ask is, uh, which of these subgroups is dominating? Which of these groups appear uh, pretty much compared to the other ones? Um, right, so here comes arithmetic statistics. Although I have a complete classification for the torsion part of an elliptic curve over Q, but Arithmetic statistics suggest the following. Give me one of the 15 groups that I mentioned in the previous slide. What's the proportion of all elliptic curves with that torsion group? So you get the flavor of arithmetic statistics. I'm always looking for the whole set of things. And I'm trying to find the proportion of um, a subset with certain properties. Right, so let me recall uh, one of the classical questions that I started with, again, I want to answer this question. It's a question about elliptic curves, but of course the motivation is coming always from the classical situation. So I want to describe all primes that looked this way. So my approach was count all primes in that format up to a certain bound, and then you caution by the number of all these primes. Then you find the limit when X goes to infinity and you hope that the limit exists. I want to do the same exact thing for elliptic curves. So here are the challenges. Here is a list of challenges. First of all, such elliptic curves, do they exist or not? Are there infinitely many of them? Because if there are only finitely many of them, then the question makes no sense. I have finitely many, so obviously the proportion is zero. Do we have explicit parameterization of these curves or not? And the most important question, going back to primes, we managed to answer this question because basically I can stack all primes up to a certain bound. Primes are just integers, and I know that I can order integers. But now I have geometric objects. How can I measure elliptic curves? How can I tell whether an elliptic curve is bigger or smaller than another elliptic curve? So that's the biggest challenge. How can I find the size? How can I attach a size for an elliptic curve? Right, and then once I managed to find the size, the question is, let's count all the elliptic curves up to a certain size. Right, so let me answer these questions one by one. The first three questions, they have a positive answer. In fact, yes, yes, and yes. And in fact, I have one single answer. Um, I have an explicit parameterization 
uh, using the projective line, which means that I have infinitely many such. So I have the explicit description. I have a positive answer and they have infinitely many. Uh, think about T isomorphic to Z quotient uh, 7Z. I know that any elliptic curve with that torsion is one of these, where T is just a rational number. So now with the big question, how can I order elliptic curves? How can I tell whether an elliptic curve is bigger or smaller than another elliptic curve? So that was the challenge. Uh, before giving you an answer what the size of an elliptic curve is, I'm going to start with a smaller set of elliptic curves. I'm not going to deal with all elliptic curves, but this set of elliptic curves. This set of elliptic curves, let me call it small elliptic curves. So in this set, I'm assuming that A and B are not divisible by large powers. What's good about this set of elliptic curves the good thing is any elliptic curve is isomorphic to one of these small elliptic curves. So it makes sense to count inside this set instead of counting inside the set of uh, all elliptic curves. And then the size is the following. It's called the height of elliptic curves, and the height is nothing but um, a quantity that depends on the expressions A and B appearing in the coefficient of the elliptic curve. So you raise the absolute value of a to the power three, b to the power two, these are weights. I'm not going to bother you with technicalities, but this works well as a size for elliptic curves. So now we have the size and we are ready to answer this question. I'm going to count all elliptic curves with a certain torsion up to a certain size. The answer was given by Haran and Snowden in 2017. Uh, for a pretty answer, they gave us logarithmic expressions. So instead of counting all elliptic curves up to a certain bound, they computed the log of this, and they quotient by the log of x, where x is the bound. They took the limit when x goes to infinity, and turns out that this limit exists, and it's equal to 1 over d, and d depends on the torsion group that you are starting with. So to give you a hint, when I'm talking about the trivial torsion group, I have 6 over 5, so this quantity is 5 over 6, and these are examples of the other Ds. Um, well, this means that the trivial group is the one that dominates. So if you pick any elliptic curve randomly, most probably it will turn out to an elliptic curve with no um, torsion uh, over Q. Right. Uh, so I showed you how to use arithmetic statistics to talk about T. Obviously, now I have to show you how to use arithmetic statistics to talk about the infinite part, the rank. So what do we know about the rank? R tells us how big EQ is, but the real question is how big R can be. Can R be 1 million, for example? Can it be 1 billion? So here is the folklore conjecture. The folklore conjecture tells you that R can be arbitrary large. So if you give me any integer, 1 million, I can find you an elliptic curve whose rank right here is 1 million, or not. Um, right, so there is a story behind this conjecture. Um, there has been at least two flips in the belief of number theorists about ranks for elliptic curves. So in 1960, uh, Honda conjectured that this rank should be bounded. So no matter which elliptic curve you are going to choose, if you manage to compute the rank of this elliptic curve, this rank will turn out to be bounded by a certain integer. And then starting from the second half of the 60s, uh, people started believing in the opposite conjecture. So they believed that this rank is indeed unbounded. And the reason was uh, the development of computers. So people were managing to compute elliptic curves with large rank, large and large with years. Uh, however, the largest elliptic curve, the largest elliptic curve, by this I mean an elliptic curve with the largest possible rank, is an elliptic curve whose rank is 28. And this elliptic curve was found in 2006 by Elkis, so obviously 28 is not really a big number to believe this conjecture. A few years ago, um, Poonin um, and others conjectured again the opposite, so back to Honda. So they came up with this heuristic, and this heuristic uh, suggests that the rank should be bounded again. And last year, another mathematician, Duyella, suggested that, again, this heuristic is not correct. At least it needs to be modified, because he managed to come up with an elliptic curve, uh, sorry, with a family of elliptic curves that doesn't need uh, that heuristic. So obviously, this conjecture 
is not really a conjecture. People are flipping between uh, being bounded and being unbounded. So instead of talking about this conjecture, because we really don't have a specific belief, uh, I'm going to talk about another uh, conjecture that we believe more in. So again, I'm going to start with the set of small elliptic curves. I'm reminding you that I'm interested in elliptic curves with a certain uh, size. The size is bounded by X. This is a conjecture that um, all number theories believe in. It's called the minimalist conjecture. And in the minimalist conjecture, um, you are considering all elliptic curves up to a certain height. You are finding the ranks of every single elliptic curve in this set right here, and you are adding them up. And then you are averaging by the number of elliptic curves up to this height. This conjecture is equal, this conjecture tells you that this limit is equal to one over two. So roughly, this means that asymptotically, half of the elliptic curves are of rank zero, and the other half is of rank one. What do we know about this conjecture right now? Well, Bhargava, Shankar, and Skinner, using um, techniques from arithmetic statistics, were the first to prove that um, this limit indeed exists. Not only this, it must be less than one. In fact, it must be less than this number. Not only this, it must be larger than this number. And this is one of the results for which Bargava was awarded his Fields Medal. And um, among other things that Bargava managed to show is that almost 20% of elliptic curves have rank zero and almost 16%, at least 16% of elliptic curves have rank one. So we are getting closer and closer to the minimalist conjecture, this conjecture from the previous slide. We're not here yet, we're not with half, but at least we're less than one. Right, so um, here is another aspect of arithmetic statistics. Arithmetic statistics can tell us something about uh, ranks of elliptic curves. What I'm going to talk about now is another aspect of elliptic curves. The good thing about elliptic curves, when you start with one elliptic curve over the rational, I can always reduce this elliptic curve modulo any prime. Um, all I need to do is think about this A and B being integers, and then consider them modulo a given prime. And then again, because I'm interested in size, I'm going to assume more technical things. I'm going to call such equation P minimal, so minimal with respect to the prime that I started with, if the valuation of the discriminant, if the power of P dividing the discriminant is the smallest among all elliptic curves. So that's why I call it P minimal. And the good thing about elliptic curves over the rational field, any elliptic curve has a globally minimal Weierstrass equation. So I can minimize every single elliptic curve over Q modulo every single prime. Um, right, so I'm going to start with such elliptic curve. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to consider the coefficients A and P, sorry, A and B modulo P. So that's an elliptic curve not over the rational field now, but over a finite field. And if you think about this picture now, one elliptic curve will give rise to infinitely many elliptic curves because I have infinitely many points. The next question is, well, I did that, um, but when I reduce my elliptic curve, is there a guarantee that I would still have an elliptic curve over the finite field? So here is an example. I'm starting with a very specific elliptic curve. That's the equation, x cubed plus 432x plus this number. This is how you sketch it. And I'm giving you a picture about what happens to this elliptic curve modulo the first few primes. So if you look at the red spots, obviously these are not elliptic curves anymore because remember the condition on elliptic curve was it should be smooth. That's a nodal curve, that's a nodal, sorry, that's a nodal, that's a nodal, that's a cuspidal, that's a cuspidal curve. So obviously these are not smooth. But if you look at the green ones, these are smooth ones. And I'm telling you that after P is 17, every single other spot would be green. So this means that I only have finitely many spots which are red. The question is, is that true in general? The answer is yes. If you start with an elliptic curve and you reduce it modulo any prime, then, because I'm starting with a monic cubic equation, then definitely when I reduce it modulo prime, I'm still having a cubic equation. 
So I'm still have a cubic equation. So the question is, is it smooth or not? Right, so again, it's a question about the discriminant. This quantity, if you remember, um, a cubed minus uh, b to the power three times constant. So if you look at the discriminant, you are interested whether this discriminant is zero modulo p or not. So if it's not zero modulo p, which means that the valuation of the discriminant is equal to zero, then E is said to have good reduction in P. So this means that the elliptic curve I'm starting with will reduce to an elliptic curve modulo P. But what happens when the valuation of the discriminant is larger than zero? So the prime divides the discriminant. So this means that modulo P, this discriminant is equal to zero. Then obviously I don't have an elliptic curve anymore. I have a singular curve. And then E is said to have bad reduction in this prime. And I have two cases. If the discriminant has a positive valuation, then you look at this coefficient A and you see whether the valuation is zero or not. And according to this, I have two types of um, singularities, multiplicative or what we saw in the previous slide as nodal curve or additive or what we saw as cospedal, right? So that's the technical part of it, right? So obviously discriminants are important uh, because it tells you how many primes are bad um, not only this, it tells you how hard it is to get rid of the singularity. So that's a question for algebraic uh, geometers. So here is a question about this important invariance, the discriminants. If I'm starting with an integer, how many elliptic curves E are there such that the discriminant of E is equal to that integer? So again, another explicit question, I'm trying to find all elliptic curves whose discriminant is equal to a specific integer. Here are a few answers. Uh, we are sure that there are no elliptic curves with D being positive or negative one. Again, if you think about it, this means that there is no prime dividing the discriminant. So this means that all the spots are green. There are no red spots. So whenever I reduce my elliptic curve, I'll get an elliptic curve. Um, Shafarovich, uh, in one of his famous theorems, managed to prove that up to isomorphism over the rational field Q, there are only finitely many elliptic curves with a given discriminant. So five, there are only finitely many elliptic curves with discriminant five. One million, there are only finitely many elliptic curves with discriminant one million. But the question is how finite? And that's an existing question. The next question, of course, is can I describe all elliptic curves with a given discriminant or not? Right, so um, Cremona together with uh, his student Lingam managed to show that there is an algorithm. You give me the elliptic curve, you give me a set of primes, the algorithm will spit out all elliptic curves with bad primes given in this set S. So as an example, if you choose Q and you choose the only, um, sorry, you choose the primes two and three only, then there are only 600, sorry, 6,120 elliptic curves over Q with discriminant a power of two times a power of three. So again, this means that there are two red spots, all the other red spots are green, and the red spots are happening at the primes two and three. And that was a new, that was um, uh, found out by Og and Hadano um, like 20 years uh, before Kermona and the student came up with their algorithm. Right, so um, let's go more generic. Let's ask about all elliptic curves whose minimal discriminant is a prime power. So this means that I only have one red spot, all the other spots are green. Um, a series of work of many mathematicians uh, came up with a solution to this question. And it tells you that the discriminant of any elliptic curves, if you're looking for a prime power discriminant, it's either power one or power two. Any larger power will go down to 11 to the power five, 17 to the power four, 19 to the power three, 37 to the power three, and that's it. So we have a complete classification of all elliptic curves with discriminant being a prime power. In fact, there is a conjecture and open question, as I told you, elliptic curves, that's an open source for challenging question. We still don't know whether there are infinitely many elliptic curves with prime discriminants, so the case here or not. Of course, the next question, we're going step by step. So we thought about a power of a prime. Now the question is a product of two prime powers. Can I list all elliptic curves for which the discriminant is a product of two powers of primes? Right, so let me give you some history about the problem. 
um, as long as I'm assuming two torsion, then I can list all elliptic curves with uh, discriminant being a product of powers of primes as long as one of these primes is two. This was given by this P. If I'm assuming N torsion, I mean, if you see in my history, I'm always assuming torsion on elliptic curves. So the torsion is non-trivial. And I want to find all elliptic curves with discriminant, a power of a prime times another power of another prime, then I can find a complete classification of these elliptic curves. And the, this was given by these people right here. But if you remember this theorem that I showed you about torsion, uh, that the torsion group that really dominates is the trivial one. It's not the two torsion. It's not the n torsion where n is larger than four. It is the trivial torsion. That's still an open question. So in the dominating case, we, we cannot find all elliptic curves for which the discriminant is a product of two prime powers. So we are stuck here. But as you see in my talk, whenever we are stuck, I'm turning into arithmetic statistics and then trying to come up with an alternative asymptotic solution. Let me give you a hint about what people have been doing here. Um, this question is hard for a reason. Remember when I told you that any elliptic curve can be minimized module every single prime? The unfortunate thing is these elliptic curves are not described by a short by a short equation y squared is x cubed plus ax plus b anymore. It should be described by such long equation. And I can attach some invariance to this elliptic curve. And in that case, this is the discriminant, the last line here. And remember, my question is, can I find all elliptic curves for which the discriminant is a product of two prime powers. So the last line must be a product of two prime powers. So that's an equation. And I'm trying to solve this equation in P, Q, alpha, beta, all the Bs. And remember, these Bs were functions in A's themselves. And this is why the question is hard. This is why we are stuck. We cannot find explicit description of elliptic curves for which the discriminant is a product of two prime powers. Right. But at least let me give you an answer that we know. Um, if you want to describe all elliptic curves with um, six torsion point for which the discriminant is a product of two prime powers, then this is the list of possible discriminants. We have a list for all such uh, torsion as long as the torsion is non-trivial. For example, if we are insisting on 10th torsion on elliptic curves, then the discriminant cannot be a product of two prime powers. Right, now arithmetic statistics again. And instead of thinking about single instances, instead of, of thinking about um, explicit solutions to our questions, let's think about asymptotic solutions. So what's the proportion of elliptic curves for which the discriminant satisfies the following? Um, I wrote conductor here. Conductor is again, another invariant for elliptic curves and uh, the good thing about conductor, um, the only prime divisors of conductors are the same as the prime divisor of discriminants. So we're not going to distinguish much between discriminants and conductors. Geometers, they like conductors more, but again, all you need to know is that discriminants and conductors, they have the same exact prime divisors. Right, so in 2023, together with Cremona, we managed to come up with the following answer the proportion of semi-stable elliptic curves over Q is almost 61% of all elliptic curves. Um, semi-stable elliptic curves, so this means that if you look at the red spots, I only have nodal singularity. So forget about the cuspidal singularity. So basically, at every single prime, I either have good reduction or multiplicative reduction. And it turns out that these elliptic curves are the majority. So the proportion of all these elliptic curves is 61%. Uh, if you are looking for discriminants that are square free, then the proportion of these elliptic curves is almost 43%. So obviously, again, although we were stuck with explicit solution, arithmetic statistics managed to provide us with a symptotic solution. At least I know the proportion of these elliptic curves, elliptic curves with certain conditions, certain restrictions on the discriminant. Right. In my remaining 10 minutes, I'm going to show you another aspects of um, this arithmetic statistics approach. 
what kind of other questions we can answer about elliptic curves. So I'm going to start with an elliptic curve, as usual, that equation here. And that's the smoothness condition, so the discriminant is different from zero. And I'm recalling, I'm reminding you that an elliptic curve over Q, if, I, if you are looking at the pairs X and Y, satisfying this equation with coordinates in Q, then this is isomorphic to R copies of Z times the torsion point. Right. And again, recall that I can reduce my elliptic curve modulo P. So instead of A, I have AP, which is A modulo P. Same with BP. Some facts that we prove for our students in a first uh, course in elliptic curves is the following. The torsion of elliptic curves say something about the elliptic curves modulo P. In fact, the torsion injects in the set of rational points over the finite field. So again, remember, I reduce my elliptic curve modulo P. I'll get an equation describing an elliptic curve. All you need to do now is that's an elliptic curve over a finite field. So I can count the pairs X and Y modulo P satisfying this equation. And there are finitely many because it's a finite field. The first fact tells you that the torsion subgroup of the elliptic curve, it injects in this set of rational point modulo P, which means that the order of the torsion it divides the order of the reduction of the elliptic curve, and this happens for every single prime that doesn't divide the discriminant. So if you have an elliptic curve with certain torsion, let's say seven, and reduce it modulo every single prime, for sure, the order of the reduction of the elliptic curve modulo P, the number of pairs satisfying this equation, it will be divided by seven. It's divisible by seven. So that's a nice fact. Very simple to prove. And if you recall Mazur big theorem, well, the order of the reduction is one of these numbers. Remember these 15 groups, these are um, the orders of these 15 groups. So you reduce an elliptic curve modulo P as long as the elliptic curve has non-trivial torsion, then the order of the reduction would be divisible by the order of the torsion. So a global fact about the elliptic curve, it tells you something local about the elliptic curve. Serrant Katz in a very big theorem managed to prove that the converse hold as well. So if you look at the elliptic curve module every single prime, and it turns out that all the reductions of the elliptic curve are divisible by a single prime, sorry, by a single number, then this means that the elliptic curve itself has torsion divisible by this number. So you start with the torsion, you get the reduction divisible by the order of the torsion. And if it turns out that the order of the reduction is divisible by the order of the torsion, then this means that the elliptic curve you started with has that torsion. So that's what this theorem tells you. Both directions work. So again, that works for proportion one of primes. So if you manage to prove it for density one of primes, proportion one of primes, then you get the converse direction, which means that the only allowed integers to divide all the reductions of elliptic curves modulo primes, again, these are the integers provided by Mazur theorem. So what we were thinking of was, what if I change the density one? What if I'm concerned with integers that do not lie in the list of Mazur? What kind of answers we can get? So as usual, I'm going to remind you of the classical question. Um, at some point, I wanted to find the proportion of primes that look like one modulo four, if you remember, three modulo four, or alpha modulo m in general. And what we did was, all you need to do is to count all primes up to a certain bound, quotient out by the number of primes. You take the limit, pray that the limit exists, and you're done. I'm going to do the same. I'm going to start with an integer that's not in the list of Mazur. And I'm going to start with an elliptic curve. And the question would be, what's the density of prime for which the order of the reduction is congruent to this alpha modulo m. You can think about it one modulo four. So m, pick it to be any integer not in Mazur's list, and alpha can be any congruence class. And again, arithmetic question is offering this, is offering this approach. How can I find the proportion of elliptic curve satisfying this? Right, so a starting example. Uh, one of my students and myself, we came up with um, several families of elliptic curves. That's one of them. 
So that's not only an elliptic curve, that's a family of elliptic curves. You change T to be any rational number, you will get an elliptic curve. And what we managed to show is as long as T is a square modulo P, so that's the Legendre symbol, then the order of the reduction of this elliptic curve modulo P must be congruent to zero modulo five. Not only this, there are infinitely many rational values of this T such that the order of the reduction is divisible by 10. And this proportion of primes is in fact at least one over six. And we can dig deeper in this divisibility condition. In fact, a positive proportion of primes uh, will satisfy this condition that the order of the reduction of the elliptic curve is indeed divisible by 20. And again, if you remember 20 wasn't in the list of Mazur. So that's an example of an elliptic curve for which we can compute the order of the reduction modulo 20 and the 20 is not in Mazur's list. But what we were aiming for was more than this. Uh, that was our motivating example. That's an example of an elliptic curve, non-trivial example. And by non-trivial example for people interested in elliptic curves, this means that it, ha it has no complex multiplication. The order of the reduction of the elliptic curve module any prime, no matter which prime you're looking for, it depends on the congress class of the prime. So as long as P is congruent to these numbers module 20, then the order of the reduction must be divisible by 12. And as long as P is congruent to three and seven module 20, then the order of the reduction must be congruent to six module 12. And that was the only example in the literature. So in essence, we know that um, the order of the reduction is divisible by 12 for primes of density three over four, and it's congruent to six module 12 for the rest of primes, primes of density one over four. Right. So what we did is we looked at this example and it turns out that this elliptic curve is isogenous to an elliptic curve with torsion six. And that explains six dividing 12 here, but it doesn't explain why I have 12 instead of six. The other observation was, although elliptic curve uh, doesn't have a torsion 12 over Q, but over a quadratic extension, the torsion part is this. So it is of order 12. And that turns out to be true. So again, together with Antigona Piazzetti in 2022, we managed to show that this is true in general and that this example can be generalized to a bigger family of examples. Examples of elliptic curves that do not have torsion over Q, but over an extension of Q, they have torsion. And again, as we did with Sen and Katz, this torsion, this global fact about the elliptic curve, it tells you something about the local information about the elliptic curve, that I can say something about the order of the reduction. In fact, the order of the reduction is divisible by certain integers, and these integers are coming from the torsion over the quadratic extension, or it's congruent to certain numbers module this integer. A very quick example to finish with, so that's an elliptic curve that didn't exist in the literature before. It's described by this Weierstrass equation. After certain computation, I can tell you that, well, the order of the reduction of the elliptic curve module any prime, if the prime is one of these module 15, it must be divisible by 16. If it's congruent to this module 15, then it's either 0, 4, 8, 12, module 16. So this means that 3 module 16, for example, doesn't happen. 5 module 16 doesn't happen. 14 module 16 doesn't happen. So these are the only congruence restrictions on the order of the reduction, and they are completely governed by the congress classes of the points. Right, let me thank you and stop here.